Hello there, and welcome back to A Course in Cognitive Linguistics. In the last episode, I was talking about categorization and the idea that categories are organized around so-called prototypes, that is, central members of the category that unify all of the typical features of that category. And as you move towards the periphery of the category, you find more marginal members that do not share all of the features that you usually expect of that category. Okay, here you see some pictures of prototypical and less prototypical birds. Uh, what does that have to do with linguistics? Well, it turns out that linguistic categories like word meanings or syntactic constructions are in fact categories that are organized in a prototypical way. So that, for instance, if you have a word such as over, there are certain meanings of over that are prototypical central, and other meanings that are more peripheral, so extended meanings of the original prototypical meaning. Right, we'll get to that. So today's topic is polysemy, which in a nutshell means that you have a single linguistic form with several related meanings. Now, um, in order to get us started, it's useful to think about normal signs, or to think about signs in a way that the average person on the street would think about them. So, um, if you were to approach a friend who is not a linguist and ask them, okay, how, how do words work? They would probably say that, yeah, uh, you have a string of sounds or a string of letters, and that string maps onto a certain meaning in a one-to-one -one fashion. So, if I say the word banana, that makes you think of a yellow edible fruit. Right. Now you and I know that this one-to-one -one mapping of form and meaning is uh, not the whole story. There's things that are complicating the picture. For instance, we have the phenomenon of synonymy in which several forms map onto more or less the same meaning. So pants and trousers both map onto the meaning of a piece of clothing that you can put on the lower half of your body. And then, of course, there is the opposite scenario where a single form maps onto several meanings, and that is polysemy. But it's not only polysemy. Yeah, you notice that I put homonymy and polysemy. Homonymy is also sometimes called um, ambiguity, and if you've taken your Linguistics 101, you know what I'm talking about. Cases like bank, which can mean the sloping margin of a river, or a financial institution, or uh, race, can mean competition, or a genetically defined population group, or bat, can be a small flying animal, or it can be a sporting instrument that you use uh, to play baseball. Right, so that is one way of having a single form with several meanings. And in this case here, the meanings are unrelated. So there's no common semantic core to a bat, the animal, and a bat, the baseball gear. Unless you find one. I don't, but maybe you do. Um, so in any case, the different scenario of polysemy uh, describes a mapping of one form to many meanings in which the many meanings are related in some way. So examples are, for instance, summit, top of a mountain, and meeting at the highest political level, and a table, a furniture item, um, and a presentation of information in a rectangular format of rows and columns. Now, to be sure, these meanings are very different. Yeah, top of a mountain and a meeting of guys in suits very different. But nonetheless, I'm willing to bet that you're saying, well, I can sort of see the relation. Yeah? Top of a mountain, that's the highest possible uh, position that you can get to, and also human society is sort of organized in a hierarchical fashion so that you have very few people at the top, and when they meet, then that's the, that's the summit. Yeah, okay. Um, bottom line, in polysemy, one form maps onto two related meanings. To summarize this ambiguity, uh, illustrated by things like bat, um, maps single form onto several unrelated meanings, and so it actually makes sense to speak of uh, bat and bat as two different words. In fact, if you open a dictionary, 
uh, chances are that you will find two bats in there, yeah? two separate entries, bat one, the animal, and bat two, the sporting instrument. And then you have uh, polysemy in which the diagram looks almost the same, but you see the dotted line between the two meanings. The meanings are related. So that, for instance, table is a single word with several related meanings. Okay, you notice that there's a little bit of space left on the right side, so there is something more that I want to talk about, and that is vagueness. Vagueness is sort of an extreme case of uh, polysemy in which the several meanings are so close that we have a hard time distinguishing between them. Okay, so for instance, the word reporter may refer to a male reporter or a female reporter, and arguably these are slightly different meanings. But nonetheless, um, you could rightfully say, well, for a reporter, gender is simply not a relevant category. It, it makes no difference whether the person who does the news reporting is a, mom a woman or a man. Right, so this motivates the circle around the different meanings there, so that we really see them as one. And the word reporter is simply vague with regard to the gender that this person has. Right, okay. Um, now, if you've taken your Linguistics 101, uh, this is sort of continuing the basic stuff. We, we need to go through this to get to the coggling stuff in a couple of minutes. So there have been several tests that have been devised to uh, tell you whether a word is ambiguous or not. So uh, one test is the so-called logical test where you insert the candidate word into the sentence. This is an X, but not an X. If you do that with unambiguous, monosomous words, then you get a slightly odd sentence that is semantically difficult to interpret. So if I say this is a banana, not a banana, you think that, well, he was always a bit strange, but now he's gone over the edge, I think. Um, so this is a banana, not a banana. It's, it's hard to interpret in a literal way. However, if I say, well, this is a bank, not a bank, uh, you get the sense that, okay, he's probably talking about the, the furniture bank and the uh, financial institution bank, or about the, the river bank and the financial bank. So <clears throat> there's a way to interpret the sentence, and this tells you that the item bank is ambiguous. There's furthermore something called the definition test that asks you to think about the meaning of an element and the question whether, for instance, the word painter uh, has a common semantic core even when it's used to describe a utilitarian painter and an artistic painter. Arguably, the two have something in common. They both um, use paint and brushes and um, well, they apply this paint to surfaces uh, with different purposes, of course, but nonetheless, um, at the end of the day, they're both covered in, I don't know, splashes of green and blue and whatnot. Yeah, so there is a common core of meaning uh, with regard to painter. Um, not so much for uh, <clears throat> bank or, or bat. Right. Then there is a battery of linguistic tests that have been developed. Um, <clears throat> this is the so-called do-so test, uh, where you insert the, um, no, the, the candidate word into the sentence X did Y and so did Z. So sentences like I have a bat and so does Bill. Now, if I say that and want to mean by that that I have an animal bat and Bill has a sporting instrument bat, then you would say, oh, this is you know, slightly funny and, and not funny at the same time. Um, so this effect is called uh, zugma, zugmatic. Um, if you get this kind of zugma effect, then um, the item is ambiguous. If you don't get a zugmatic effect, then the item is not ambiguous. Another linguistic test is the so-called gapping test. So that's the sentence uh, A did B and C D. So between C and D, there's a gap, syntactic terminology. Um, okay, if I say, I lost my wallet in Argentina, the World Cup final, you're saying, oh, Martin, you're so tongue-in-cheek today. Yeah. Um, so lose a wallet 
and lose a soccer game, they're not quite the same. Yeah? So lose is ambiguous because you get this zygmatic effect. Right. Um, then there are puns of varying quality. Uh, so how did the tipster burn his tongue? You guessed it, he sipped his coffee before it was cool. So if a pun works, that means that the word you're testing is ambiguous, so cool is ambiguous. Um, quite often puns, well, people are different in the way they respond to puns. Uh, I usually find them hilarious. Other people say, oh, well, not that funny. Right, that's just me. Okay, so um, there are certain problems with these tests that have been pointed out. You, you learn them in your linguistics intro class, but even as a student, you kind of sense that uh, sometimes there really are no clear yes or no answers. Yeah. Does a pun work? For some people, yes. For other people, no. Uh, do you get a zoomatic effect? Um, some people might say, well, I lost my wallet in Argentina, the World Cup final. It's totally fine. Yeah. So it seems that these tests don't give us the last answer to the distinction between ambiguity and polysemy, on the other hand. And sometimes uh, the tests are even in mutual conflict. So I can say I'm a painter, but not, you know, a painter. Uh, so that the logical test suggests ambiguity, but the common meaning suggests vagueness and not ambiguity. Right, so bottom line, the tests are not the final answer on what uh, ambiguity, uh, polysemy and vagueness really are. And that's how um, cognitive linguists have come to propose that these are actually stations on a continuum from clear cases of distinct meanings uh, that are uh, weakly, if at all, related to a, to a common meaning. So this would be the case for, for instance, summit, mountaintop, meeting of decision makers. Yeah, we can sort of see the common relation, but it's not that obvious. And then as we move along the continuum, we get cases in which the commonalities between the meanings become ever stronger. So um, we have things like string, which can be a thin rope, you know, a piece of string that you use to tie up a parcel or something. And a string can also be a part of a guitar. Yeah. Um, so these two have the same shape, different uses, but nonetheless, uh, from, from the point of view of the, the human being looking at it, they look very similar. Okay, we go further along on the continuum and we get things like wing, uh, which can be a body part of a bird or a part of an airplane. And these two meanings are very similar indeed and they're obviously related through a common meaning. They're both used as, you know, a part of, of things that fly, you know, be they animals or constructed machines. And then towards the far end of the continuum, we have the same form with barely distinguishable meanings, where the common meaning is in fact more accessible than the different meanings. So reporter, I've already mentioned that case, grandmother can be the mother's mother or the father's mother. Aunt is another case of that. So um, instead of the clear and crisp categorical distinction that the tests for ambiguity uh, and vagueness suggests. Um, here we would have a more nuanced picture that, that says, well, these things fall along a continuum. Okay, there are several advantages of the continuum view, namely uh, gradients, so non-discreteness in, in distinctions, is found in many other linguistic categories. We talked about categories, Here's the link. Um, categories are organized in a prototypical way so that you have central and peripheral members. And so uh, why not assume the same for polysemy and ambiguity? The traditional tests of ambiguity and vagueness correctly identify cases at the endpoints of the continuum. So we don't have to um, you know, put these tests 
uh, file this, these tests away or, or you know forget about them. Rather, they're, they're pretty useful to identify extreme cases. But nonetheless, um, they are less useful at the boundaries, in the middle of the continuum, and those are the cases that are really of most interest to us. So, advantage of the continuum view is that in-between cases are naturally accounted for. However, the continuum view also comes with a number of inherent problems. So how do we know where exactly a word is on the continuum? Think of words like nose. Yeah, I have a nose, your dog has a nose. Is this the very same meaning or is that slightly different? So where do we put nose on the vagueness ambiguity continuum? Uh, what about va wave? Yeah, A wave in the ocean? Uh, wave as in light wave and wave of <clears throat> well uh, you can have metaphorical waves that, that come in fashions for instance sometimes described as a wave um, <clears throat> well I'll, I'll, I'll let you explore that on your own uh, then there's uh, the word since which can have a temporal meaning since last Tuesday I've had this nasty cold or it can be causal. Since Martin is German, he knows a lot about beer. Yeah, so is this ambiguity? Is this vagueness? Is this polysemy? How do we know? And then uh, there is the famous word over. So a lot has been said about the polysemy of over. Um, over can mean a lot of different things, and I'd like you to think about this a little bit. Um, so if you have a few minutes, why don't you pause this video and think of a couple of meanings that the word over can have and try to you know, develop an idea in your mind of what is the, the basic meaning of over. Maybe you can draw a little picture of that. Okay, um, if you want to do that, do it now. I'll continue. So something that's been proposed in the literature is that the basic meaning of over at least in the dynamic sense of over, is this one here. The bird flew over the house. So you have two little forms here, an oval and a square, and the oval is sort of moving over the square. And the, the oval is marked TR, that means trajectory, and the square is marked LM, that means landmark. Okay. Now, there are different meanings of over. Maybe you've drawn something that looks like this. Uh, maybe you've drawn something different. Um, here's another sense of over. Uh, John walked over the bridge. So he made contact with the bridge. He was in contact with the bridge. And uh, what we really want to say with this is that he crossed the bridge. So um, what's similar, but you can see similarities between the two, but also differences. <clears throat> so clearly John was sort of on top of the bridge, um, while the bird was not on top of the house, it was higher than that. So small differences, but crucial differences. Um, I can even say something like the cathedral is over the bridge. Now, the cathedral didn't exactly cross the bridge to get there. Maybe the individual stones had to be carried over the bridge, but certainly um, the cathedral isn't moving anywhere. Yeah. But what I want to say with this is that if you want to see the cathedral, you have to go over the bridge, and there it will be. Another sense of over is that the paper is over the hole. It's, it's covering the hole. We can't see the hole. Um, can you? No, I can't. So, uh, and uh, another sense of over, the dots are all over the carpet, <clears throat> meaning that there are evenly distributed across the surface of the carpet. Okay, what I want you to appreciate is that in all of these scenarios we use the word over, and happily so. Yeah? No second questions about, you know, this, is this really over? Uh, yes, it is over. <laughs> um, and still, the meanings are distinctly different. So people have been going absolutely nuts about over and other prepositions and have come up, oh yeah, another one, the fans fell over, um, have come up with these fantastic networks of meanings that prepositions have. So this is just one analysis uh, where you have the, the prototype, which is the, the bird flew over 
the house, and then um, all sorts of different um, meanings, the covering sense, the examining sense. You can look over somebody's term paper. Um, you can do something over, meaning that you can, you can do it again and again. Um, above and beyond, just, uh, he earns over uh, six figures and you know, things like that. Right, okay. Um, the basic point, the basic take-home lesson of this is that uh, words have basic senses and extended senses. So the, the basic senses correspond to what I've talked about in the last video as the prototype of a category. So these central senses tend to be conceptually simple, at least simpler than the marginal senses. They also tend to be frequent, so used often. The thing that you hear most often, uh, well, the, the use that you hear most often of a word that tends to correspond to the prototype. Um, the basic senses tend to be learned early by children, and they are conceptually connected to many other senses. If we go back to the network for a moment, you see that the prototype has lots and lots of connections to other uh, meanings of over, and those other meanings are less well connected, so they, they connect to fewer other nodes. So if you draw up a network like this, and you notice that one sense has a lot in common with other senses, well, there's your prototype. Okay, um, how do we get to these networks? Uh, how do new senses emerge? They emerge when a word is used in new contexts. So uh, if you use a word like over in scenarios that um, haven't been used before, but they're still recognizable as being a case of over. They relate to earlier meanings of over. And so new senses can, uh, over time, establish themselves. And the result of these kinds of successive meaning extensions is then called a radial category. Radial because, well, the meaning sort of radiate outward from a prototype. Okay. All of this sounds very plausible and very interesting and somehow intuitive, um, but we should realize that it's also a very strong hypothesis. So what cognitive linguists try to do is really to model the semantic networks that people have in their minds so that each node in the network corresponds to a representation in the speaker's mental lexicon. Yeah, I have a mental lexicon in my mind, and in that mental lexicon, there is an entry over, and this entry has certain sub-entries and relations between sub-entries and so on and so forth, and that is what supposedly is um, shown in this network here. Okay, the more skeptic among you will think, well, maybe is that the too strong hypothesis? Maybe the network reflects uh, the ideas of some crazy professor and not the ideas that actual speakers have in their minds. And that's a valid criticism. That's a criticism that has been voiced by, for instance, uh, Sandra and Rice in a classic paper from 1995. So they were interested in these network analyses and uh, how you could lend more credence, how you could provide more evidence uh, to analyses of this kind. So they asked, how do ordinary speakers distinguish between different senses of the same word? And they did something, um, yeah, um, there's an empirical paradigm that's used in psycholinguistic research that's called a sorting task. You give people a bunch of stuff and you tell them, okay, here's a collection of things. Why don't you sort these things into categories that belong together? Okay, you can choose, um, you know, <clears throat> as many categories as you like, or sometimes you're restricted to, you know, make make two piles or make three piles or make four piles. Uh, in this case, there were some 29 participants who received cards with 20 sentences each for the prepositions at, on, and in, so different sentences with these prepositions, and the task was to sort the cards according to how the prepositions are used. And here, the participants could make as many or as few groups as they liked. To give you a better idea of the task, imagine that you get a bunch of uh, cards 
and each card has a sentence on it. Sentences like, I can say, how are you in Italian? Or make sure to get that in writing. I saw him in my dreams. There's a hole in your sweater. Are you putting onions in the stew? Don't put that in your mouth. And so on and so forth. Okay, now your task is put similar sentences in the same pile. You can make as many piles as you want, as few piles as you want. You can make just two, make three. Your decision. Just put the most similar ones into one pile. Okay, you can see how this would lead people to form little categories. Yeah? So, for instance, um, yeah, in the drawer, my pen is in the drawer, and don't put that in your mouth. I'd probably put these together because they both describe containers. So my mouth is a container, and the drawer is a container, and um, something is spatially in that container my decision. You might have a different one, but nonetheless. Okay, but clearly uh, in the drawer is a little different from in Japan or in writing. Yeah, In writing, abstract. In Japan, okay, that's a very large container if you want to think about it this way. Uh, in the drawer, more prototypical. Okay, so the sorting task then measures how often two particular sentences of the 20 are put into the same group. And you can imagine that, uh, don't put that in your mouth, my pen is in the drawer. If you have 29 participants, you would find those two in the same pile, probably with a majority of participants. Um, another pair, my pen is in the drawer, and in Japan they eat raw fish. Probably you would find those two relatively rarely together. Okay, so if you get this kind of result, uh, you can then uh, come up with a sort of <clears throat> similarity matrix uh, which shows how likely two particular sentences are to be grouped together or how unlikely two sentences are uh, to be grouped together. And what you come away with is this sort of cluster um, diagram, <clears throat> a dendrogram it's called. Um, if you Google clustering, you'll find a lot of information about how this is done in practice. Um, and uh, these are, in a nutshell, the results that Sandra and Rice obtained. And interestingly, there is a lot of semantic structure in these results. For instance, that there are uh, two sentences grouped together that are abstract senses of in. I can say, how are you, in Italian, or make sure to get that in writing. Um, there are spatial sentences. Uh, don't put that in your mouth, my pen is in the drawer. See, the participants had the same intuitions that, that I have. And um, there are temporal uses of in together. He always comes in time, and I'll be with you in a moment. Okay, so it seems that language users are clearly sensitive to different meanings of polysemous items, and the sorting task certainly shows that speakers make very fine-grained distinctions. They have some kind of network representation of in. However, uh, what is less clear is whether these distinctions are made because the task requires it. So are these sort of ad hoc categories that you never think about unless you're really forced to think about them? Or uh, do people make these decisions because they're already there in the mental lexicon? Well, I sort of tend to think that um, they are in the mental lexicon, but well, just want to mention this. Okay. Um, a second line of research on polysemy that I want to mention is not experimental, but corpus-based. And um, the basis for this corpus-based research is the observation that meaning varies with context. So, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> if you think of the word tough, sorry, wait a second. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Right, meaning varies with context. So if you think of the word tough, uh, if you find tough in a predicative construction, like x is tough, uh, and followed by a two infinitive, and uh, with an inanimate subject, such as the meaning of words is tough to analyze, um, you get a meaning of tough that, well, is difficult, basically. That's not the only meaning of tough. Tough can also mean hard to chew or, you know, <clears throat> um, okay, you could get the same, uh, well, 
if you have a sentence like this uh, steak is really tough to chew then okay tough also means kind of difficult it means um, well tough <laughs> but it contrasts uh, with a different structure in which you find tough yeah tough guys never dance here you have um, an attributive construction a tough something followed by a verb phrase and a, an animate subject so the basic take-home point from from this slide is that if you put a word in different morphosyntactic contexts and in different lexical contexts you tend to get different meaning so meaning is heavily influenced by context <clears throat> and uh, this you can actually turn to your advantage uh, in a corpus linguistic analysis of polysemous items so one study that I want to mention to you uh, is uh, Stefan Ries's study of run the English verb uh, which has a lot of different meanings you can run a mile that's fast pedestrian motion you can run for office meaning you can uh, you're a candidate for some kind of political office you can run a small business meaning that you're responsible for that business um, run can mean uh, trying to get away you can run but you cannot hide and run has a number of metaphorical meanings so um, <clears throat> yeah this is from one of my favorite songs um, okay a motor can run um, but that means the motor is functioning not that it is going anywhere on feet right so if we have a highly polysemous item like run how do we go about and analyze it. We can take sort of the sorting task approach um, by Sandra and Rice and devise a number of different sentences and ask people to uh, sort them, but we can also look at the uses of run in authentic corpus data, and that's what Stefan did. Um, the approach that is taken here is uh, goes by the name of behavioral profile analysis. So you're trying to tease apart the behaviors of different senses of run and in order to do that you extract all examples of a word such as run um, from a corpus including running runs ran and so on and so forth and you first perform some kind of um, manual semantic analysis so you label each example for its rough meaning so run a mile you would code as fast pedestrian motion and then you identify a bunch of contextual features that strike you as interesting or influential. So, for instance, the collocates, the lexical elements that you find to the left and right of a word, the morphosyntactic properties of the word itself, so whether you have running or runs or ran that you can code. And then you code for semantic features of surrounding elements, so whether you have an animate subject or an inanimate subject and so on and so forth okay uh, you annotate all those examples that you have for these features and once you have a, a database with all of this information yeah a couple of hundred examples a few variables that you uh, have information on you can apply a statistical test that investigates correlations between word senses and contextual features. Let me give you some examples for that. Um, first of all, <clears throat> what features of run did Stefan investigate? Well, on the morphological plane, past versus present, ran versus runs, simple versus progressive aspect, uh, so run versus running, active versus passive, so if something was run or if something runs, and then certain syntactic variables so it does run uh, occur in an intransitive sentence in a transitive sentence or in a complex transitive sentence so you can run uh, a campaign um, <clears throat> into the wall or something like that yeah um, the syntax can be declarative interrogative in a question or imperative uh, run can occur in a main clause or a subordinate clause and uh, on the semantic plane the subject can be human animate or inanimate and the object to the extent that you have a transitive use of run can be countable uh, it can be a mass it can be concrete or abstract um, 
and then the color kits. Uh, you can take a window from left to right, a span. Um, here it's two words to the left and two words to the right. And of course, there are more variables that you could think of. Okay, to give you an illustration, here's an annotated example of uh, use of run. My friend Bob runs a model agency. The sense is manage, yeah, run a small business. It's in the present, runs, simple and active. It's a transitive clause. Bob runs something, a model agency, uh, declarative, and it occurs in a main clause, not a subordinate clause. The subject is human. The abstract is, uh, the, the object is countable, but abstract. So a model agency is not something that you can uh, put in your hand and manipulate. And then the color kits are friend, Bob, A, and model. Now suppose you have 800 examples with this kind of information. You can sort of, arrive, well, a statistic algorithm can <clears throat> determine whether the managed sense is associated to certain configurations of variables here. So um, I'm willing to bet that you're, you're guessing that, okay, manage, that will be associated with transitive uses of run, okay? So intransitive running is more about pedestrian motion, but transitive run uh, is associated with this managed sense. If you run something, well, you can run a program that would not be managed, but you can run a business, you can run an agency, you can run a campaign. So managing <clears throat> is associated with this transitive structure. Right, um, so the conclusion is that senses have structural profiles. The managed sense is by default transitive, so all corpus examples that we find um, are transitive clauses. The subject is most often an organization, so um, this program is run by the European Union. Um, often it's in the past participle, so this was run between 1995 and 1998, and often it's followed by a preposition, so run by the European Union. Contrast this with past pedestrian motion. Um, normal physical running is almost never transitive. Yeah? You run intransitively. The subject is never an organization, rather it's um, humans and animate beings. Um, we find run rarely in the, fast in the past participle when it's about motion, and we only sometimes find it followed by a preposition. Okay, um, if you have this kind of information and you uh, feed it into a table where you have the senses in the rows and the features in the columns, so you notice that here you have uh, fast pedestrian motion and manage in the first uh, row and in the fourth row, and you have the percentages of how many uh, instances are transitive, how many have a human subject, how many are followed by a preposition, and so on and so forth. This is the kind of numerical input that a clustering algorithm can make sense of and then give you, uh, again, a tree diagram like the one that you have seen in the Sandra and Rice analysis. And again, here, there's a lot of semantic structure in this tree diagram. So fast pedestrian motion and escape are clustered closely together, manage and um, execute and in charge of are clustered together. There's a general in charge of cluster. Um, you see that towards the right hand side the transitive uses of run they cluster together and the intransitive uses of run they cluster together. So all of this gives you a quite good sense of how the semantic network of run could be organized in speakers' minds. Okay, summing up. Um, ambiguity, polysemy, and vagueness usually thought of as discrete, different categories, but in cognitive linguistics, more thought about in terms of a continuum from uh, a single form mapping on several meanings, but those several meanings are clearly distinct in ambiguity um, they are related in polysemy, and they are almost non-distinguishable in vagueness. <clears throat> um, there are central and extended sentences, where the central sense, um, 
sort of corresponds to the prototype that we've talked about in the last video. They're conceptually simple, uh, learned early on, they're frequent and highly connected to other senses. And as a word of caution, um, linguists' analysis of, of polysemy should aim to correspond to speakers' mental representations, so they should be based on some kind of empirical behavioral evidence. And I've outlined two ways of, of achieving this goal. So on the one hand, through psycholinguistic experiments like sorting tasks, and on the other hand, through corpus-based behavioral profile analyses. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, next time, I'll talk about conceptual blending, and I hope you'll go and check out that video. All right, see you then.